Gamers on Games is sponsored in part by Hey viewers, Dave here for Snappy Turtle Comics and Gallery. Snappy Turtle Gallery is your go-to destination for geeky, nerdy prints, and each is just $5. With over 600 prints and growing, you're sure to find something you'll love. Go to SnappyTurtleGallery.com today and get yours. I'm Lynn from Metalhead Minis. Great to meet you. Uh, be sure to check us out online at MetalheadMinis.com. You can find out more about our services, such as miniature painting. We also do consignment. We also teach at local game stores. Be sure to check us out at MetalheadMinis.com. Thanks for having me. by viewers like you. Okay, all right, so hi, my name is Julie. Hi, I'm Dave. Dave, nice to meet you. Um, so the game we're talking about today is Free Blades. It's a fantasy skirmish game set in our world of Phelan. You're going to be playing with six to no more than 18 models on a side. So it's a low price point to entry kind of game. Starter box is going to run $44.99. That's a playable free band of six or seven figures. Um, so you can get two players into the game for uh, under 100 bucks once you count the starter box and the rules. Okay, so let's talk about who we got on the table, the sequence of a turn, and then we're going to dive in and roll some dice. Sounds, Sounds good. good. All right. So on this side, we've got the Trezorite Crusaders. This is our version of Roman gladiators on dinosaurs. The Keshark is their leader. Packmaster is a hero. The Legionnaire is a follower. And the Sun bringer back there is their caster. This is four out of the six models you would get in a starter box for the Trazerites. Now you may notice this is an all-male faction, and that is because in the Trazerite Empire it's very patriarchal. So don't, don't allow women in the military, they can't own businesses, things like that. Okay. So you may notice on the other side we've got an all-female faction. This is the Eclipse Sisterhood, and it's the underground rebellion against the Trazerites. Okay. So the Nemesis is their leader, Sun Eater is a caster, Shadow Dancer is a hero, and the Throat Seeker hiding behind the building over here is their, uh, one of their followers. Again, four out of the six models that you get in a starter box. Okay. Okay, so the sequence of a turn goes um, events phase that determines who is going first this turn. Uh, so the Eclipse of One initiative for this demo. Okay. Then we do magic, movement, shooting, melee, and phase, and you don't have to memorize that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, important question here, do you want to roll for the girls or the boys? Uh, I'm down for fighting the patriarchy, so I'll take the, I'll take the ladies. Okay, so you're in the right place, and they've won initiative, so we're going to dive in and do some magic right now. All right. Okay, so the Sun Eater here is going to attempt to cast a spell called Nullify Armor on the Keshart. Okay. To do that, it costs her one point of power, so she'll go ahead and pay that one point. Okay. And then she's going to roll her caster rating, which is over here, D10. Her target number is two, so two or better, and it goes off. Seven. Seven. Pretty easy to cast a spell, right? I assume the harder the, or the more uh, advanced or powerful the spell, the harder it is to get off. Uh, the higher your casting roll. No. <laughs> oh, so it just costs more. It's, no, it's a target number is two. That's a base uh, rule for magic. The only difference is a summoning spell is harder to get off. So those all cost four. Now, okay. Neither of these um, casters have summoning spells, so we're never going to have to deal with that. Okay. Now the catch to this all is she rolled a seven. The sun bringer is within counterspelling distance. Okay. So he can attempt to block that. Now to block that. She has energy magic and he has spirit magic. So there's two kinds of magic in our world. Okay. If you're trying to counterspell the opposite kind, you're not as familiar, so it costs you more power. So it's going to cost him two power to try to counterspell that. And then he rolls his caster rating, which is also D10. It's a typical starter caster rating. And to block you, he's got to beat your roll. He, does, he not. does not. So your spell does go off. Okay. We'll just 
token on here to show that his armor has been nullified. That has dropped his armor value from five down to two, so it's a pretty good spell. And that is the end of your magic. Now the Sunbringer can attempt to cast a spell also. And he is going to attempt to cast a spell called Salvation on the Keshart because he suffered a life point loss in a previous turn. Okay. He's only got three life points. So he's going to try to heal that up. Okay. To do that, it's going to cost him the one power. Now he started with 15 power in the right. game, so this is towards the end of the game. Okay. Okay. Again, roll his caster rating. Target number is two. Oh, good. He rolls a 10. At that point, there's no, almost no point in trying to nullify it. Because well, we're going to... I'm going to show you a, a rule here. Okay. This is called a spike. When you roll the highest number on the die, okay. I get to roll again and add my results. So oh, 10 wow. plus 6, 16. Okay. Okay. So... Whenever you roll the highest number on the die, you get to roll again and add your results, and you get to keep doing that as long as you're rolling the highest number on the die. Exploding heads, got yep. it. Okay. The game is always going to give you a benefit for critical success, which is usually 10 over what you need. Okay. Okay. So his target number was 2. At 12, he would have had critical success. Right. The benefit he gets for critical casting is one power back. Okay. So, and if it had been a two-point spell and he had rolled 22, he would get two power back. Now, if he'd rolled 22 and it only cost one power, you always get a benefit for critical success. Right. So the thing he would have get in that case, if it only cost him one to begin with, is he'd get a fate stone, which gives him a free reroll at some point later on in the game. Oh, wow, okay. So that the benefit of the spiking uh, die and the uh, critical success is always given a benefit, is that there is no model in our game that is safe. So it doesn't matter how high your armor are, how lowly the peasant is with their D4 dagger, they can always roll high enough on that D4. And we've seen a D4 spike all the way up to 33. Wow. So sometimes some pretty epic things can happen <laughs> that you don't expect in this game. All right, so that is uh, the end of the magic phase. We're going to go to the movement phase. And I'm going to move for both sides because I've got some stuff pre-programmed to show you. So the Eclipse, Eclipse have initiatives, they're going to go first. Shadow Dancer is going to announce that she's charging the Pack Master. Okay. She says what she's doing before she does it because he's got three options. Okay. He can stand there and take it. He can attempt to evade her, which is a discipline test. Okay. Or he can counter charge, meet her in the middle. Gotcha. Now he's the Pack Master. He's not afraid of her, so he is totally going to counter charge. Okay. And they are both going to get the benefit of the charge in this instance. Okay. Okay. All right, now the Sun Eater likes where she is. The Nemesis is always ready engaged. Look at the Throat Seeker way over here. If you look at her card, these cards are free downloads from our website. Yep. Anyway, you can just print them off um, or have them professionally printed, however you like. Seven is the speed that she can move in inches. She can run up to twice that, um, but there's some limiters in what you can do when you run. And normally you can't run through windows and doors and things like that. Okay. She's got a talent called Free Runner. Okay. She's a parkour expert. So I was about to say, so she does parkour, got yeah, it. Yeah, so she can see that cash art through that building, and she can just vault through all of that and engage him at a charge and help out her leader here. Now, he cannot react to her like the pack master did because he's already engaged. Got it. Okay. ready and unengaged in order to, to, to respond. Got it. Okay, so that is the Eclipse movement. We're going to go over to the Trash Rights movement. Now, this guy already moved. This guy is engaged. And the Sunbringer likes where he is. Legionnaire is going to come around and get within short throwing range of the Sun Eater. Got it. Because he can throw that Gataru. That's going to bring up the shooting phase, which is next. Okay, so let's see how that works. It's a two-part process to do a wound. First, you have to hit and then break armor. Oh, okay. So to hit, he's going to be rolling his ranged attack rating, which is D8. Target number is set by her defense. So her defense is four. Four or better is going to be a hit. Okay. So to accomplish anything in our game, it's meter exceed target number. To block your opponent, you've got to do better than that. Got it, okay. So she's not rolling, so his uh, target is just four, so I'll go ahead and roll that. Five is going to hit, right. so now he's going to go to uh, trying to break his ar her armor. His ranged weapon has a damage of D6 plus one. Okay. Her armor value is just two. She's just wearing robes. Got it. So pretty easy to get that off. Let's see if he can. Is two like the bare minimum? 
Uh, she was going to be a bare minimum to succeed at anything. One thing we haven't seen yet is a role of a natural one. When that occurs, we call it a tarch. Um, and it's an automatic fail. Got it, so, okay. Even though he's got D6 plus one right now, if he had rolled a one, he would not get to modify that with a plus one. It would be a fail. Oh, right, okay. But he did roll a two, so that's a total of three. Her armor value is two, so he has better exceeded her armor value. Right. So he would do one more. And she's got two life points to give, so she's not dropped yet. Right. Um, we say drop not dead in our game because uh, we do have a campaign system. So if you're playing as part of a campaign, got it. at the end of the game, you go to the casualty table to see if you're dead dead or took some injury or fully recovered. Right, okay. Okay. Um, all right, so he's done one life point loss. Now, could he have done two? Yes. So if he had rolled a six and a six and then a yeah. five, 17, 18, at 12, he would be at critical damage. The benefit of critical damage is an extra life point loss to your enemy. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so that's the shooting phase. We're going to go on to melee. And we've got two melees going on, this one and this one, and we're going to do this one first. So the first thing you do when you start a combat, and this is the Pack Master and the Shadow Dancer, okay. is figure out who's going first in that combat. So chargers go before non-chargers. They both charge. No, no. Did you want to sit down? No, it's okay. I got it. Probably need some more chairs though. Okay. Um, all right. So they both charged. Then you look at discipline level. D10, D10. They're both D10 disciplines. So this is going to be a simultaneous combat. Okay. Now the way we simulate that to avoid confusion right. is we have the first player go. You completely resolve their attack, and then the second player goes. But even if she drops him, he gets to attack back. So the effects are simultaneous. Got it. Okay, so she's going to go first with her melee r attack rating of D10. Target number is his defense, which is four. So four or better. Four is going to hit. So go ahead and go straight to damage, which is D8 plus one. Six, Six and plus one. Seven, actually plus one more because of the charge. Oh, so Because uh, that's one of the benefits you get from charging. So a total of eight. His armor value is just three. So that is going to do a wound to him. Except that he does have a talent called Die Hard that says if he's about to lose a life point, he can roll his endurance, target number seven, to try to avoid that life point loss. Okay. Now he does have awesome endurance, D12, so he's got about an even shot at ignoring it. So let's see if he can. Yep. Ten, he ignores it. Okay, so her attack is over. Now he gets to attack back. Okay. And he's got a melee attack rating of D10. Okay. And her defense is five. That's his target number. Yeah, no, he weapon. misses. Okay. So that combat is over. And nobody has suffered a life point. Nobody has to take a morale test. So we'll just stick in for the next combat. Gotcha. Okay. Now we're going to go to this combat. Okay. We've got the Keshark, and then he's piled on by the Nemesis and the Throat Seeker. So a couple of things before we start that combat. Uh, first of all, the Keshark is normally defense five. Okay. Um, but the, every extra model piling onto him is going to drop his defense by one. Got so it. So he's down to four defense for this combat. The Throat Seeker is going to go first because she charged. Got it. So here she goes. She's got a melee attack rating of D8. Okay. There you go. Target number is four. And that's not going to do it. It doesn't do it. Now, the Nemesis and the Keshark are going to be simultaneous because they're both D12 discipline. Okay. But we'll go ahead and roll for the Nemesis first. D12. And if we don't get anything going here, I'm going to uh, do some divine intervention here. Okay. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> the doll have spoken. Okay. All right. So say she rolled a ten. Okay. Now the Keshar. She rolled a ten. Yes. Keshark does have a talent called Parry, so okay. he can attempt to block that hit. Okay. To do that, he's going to roll his melee attack rating. And actually, she rolled, if she had rolled a 10, it would be it's plus 1, so that would be an 11. Right. So to block her with his Parry, he'd have to roll a 12. Okay. So let's see if he can. He does not. So he has not parried, so you'll go ahead and go to damage, D8 plus 1. 
five so plus six. one is six. His armor value actually, because of the spell, is only two. So that would do a life point loss to him. Okay. Now he gets to attack back. Right. Before he does, um, most heroes in our game have something called Heroes Honor. If okay. I'm engaged with both a hero and a follower, right. I must attack the hero. It's the honorable thing to do. Okay. Um, now we've got a couple of bandit factions and a demon faction that could care less about Heroes Honor, but this guy cares. So he's going to attack the nemesis, and okay. he's got two attacks. So he's got uh, D12 with his Zakazit, that's his sword, yep. and then his uh, Belazar that he's riding bites. Okay. So we'll go ahead and roll both attacks, and her defense is five, so that's his target number. Eight hits, three does not. Now she has two parries, so she can attempt to, um, but you can only parry one attack once. Right. If that other attack had hit, she could parry both of them, so she's going to try to parry that to block that. And she's that's D12 as well. D12 plus one. Yep. Uh, nope. Four does not parry, so he's going to roll damage. Okay. It's also D8 plus one, because right. same weapon. Uh, six is going to break her armor value of three, so she's going to take a wound also. So that would be the end of this combat, and again, it would be a tie combat, so nobody would have to take a morale test. Now, if it had been like this, um, if he had not done a wound back, mm -hmm. he would have to take a morale test on his discipline, target number four. If he failed, he would uh, run directly away from that combat, Okay. and they would both have an option to try to pursue him and drop him from behind. Okay. Not likely to happen because he's a fast model. I was so going to say probably yeah. he's going to be able to. He'll probably be able to book it. Like yeah. How far does how far does this guy move? So his speed is nine. So a nine panic inches. move is going to be his speed plus d6 inches because uh, he's a fast model. Their pursuit move is going to be their speed, which is seven plus d4. Inches. There's a little intersection point where they could possibly catch him, um, but not likely. So that combat is over. Um, then we would go to the end phase. So something we haven't talked about yet, these are free downloads from our website. Right. Uh, you only need one rules product to play our game. It's called the Living Rulebook. It's okay. a, normally a $10 buy from our web store. I'm going to give you a coupon code so you can get it for free. You can get all of the updates for free. Okay. So you will never have to buy the rules for our game. We do have a um, hard copy um, learn to play that is a highly simplified version of our rules. So if you wanted to just you know break it down and get started um, in a simple kind of way, that's a ten dollar buy also. Okay. So, um, in the living rule book, you can find currently twenty different scenarios. We're adding more all the time. And in the end phase, uh, some of those scenarios call for end phase actions. Okay. So um, uh, the scenarios can be things like uh, hunting for treasure, uh, closing witch gates that are spawning demons. Closing a witch gate is an end phase action. Okay. And if you don't get them closed, demons can possibly come out as an end phase action. So you take care of any of that kind of business. That sounds really good if you were doing like a one, one player game, like a solo game. Uh, set of NPC rules. Yeah. And actually, the uh, yeah, there, we have a demon faction. So when the demons play that, there's a, a uh, the scenario is called demon infestation. Right. But when the demons are playing one versus one, uh, the uh, demons uh, take on a different scenario called demon attack that is more focused about around them coming out. That's cool. But yeah, we've got a beast hunt scenario that you could you know you could absolutely take one free band and see if you can bring down the beast. Um, all right, so the, you take care of any end phase business, you assess for victory conditions. Right. So has one side or the other won the scenario by objective? Or has one or both sides broken where half or more of their life points are off the table? So oh, okay. That's another thing that can end the game. If not, you continue playing. Uh, typical game lasts around 90 minutes. It's played on a 4x4 four four surface. This is a regulation game here that we're set up to, to demo over here. Okay. Um, 1v1 is the typical way to play, but you can absolutely play sides. You can play, um, uh, there are some scenarios that, that lend themselves very well to multiplayer games. Um, you can have one person playing, you know, the NPCs um, in some of the scenarios. So there's uh, there's a lot of flexibility to the game. We also have uh, a product in playtest called Encounters, where there's one game master and uh, 
four different players playing two models at each, you know, so a, a simple kind of uh, get started way to play. And we've got a role playing game in, in, uh, out in beta. We just released the beta rules for it. We'll be uh, releasing the living world book later on. Yeah, seeing how the stats and the damage work, I was like, this lends very well to, to an RPG kind of a kind of a situation. Yes, and it's designed. It's designed for cross play. You know, uh, we've also got a battle game that's that's far further in the future, but again, you're going to be able to take your models from one game to another, same core game mechanics, same abilities, you know, so you're going to be able to uh, to cross-play that way. So, that's our game. What do okay. you think? I think it's nice. I think it's actually, a, I think it's a real easy buy-in. So, thank you for your time. Thank and, uh, you. We'll see you later.